Well, good morning to all of you at St. Austell Light and Life. There's no doubt Peter said, uh, my name's Michael, uh, I'm the pastor here down at Helston Light and Life, and I'm so pleased to be able to share with you this morning from God's Word. I, I've been praying for you. Uh, I trust that in a, in a significant measure, uh, you are strengthened and encouraged with the hope uh, that we have in Jesus Christ. And certainly I pray uh, that something more of who he is uh, would strengthen you today as we look at God's word together. First of all, let me just say a little bit about uh, my surroundings. I've deliberately come into a small and enclosed area. I Somehow it's a beautiful day outside, uh, a gloriously sunny day, and I wanted to come inside to this small enclosed area so that perhaps we could uh, in some limited way, I recognise that sat in a borrowed caravan to do this, uh, doesn't really capture it, but I hope in some way we can enter into the scene uh, that we're going to read in God's Word together. So let me read it. It's from Matthew chapter 11, and I'm going to read just a selection of verses from the whole chapter. And it came about that when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John in prison, that enclosed area with the beauty outside, enclosed area, when John heard in prison of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed, it is, blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. And then just on to verse 20. Then he began to reproach the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they didn't repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you not be exalted to heaven? Will you? You shall descend to Hades, for if the miracles that occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And at that time, Jesus answered and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you hide these things from the wise and intelligent and did reveal them to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it was well pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my load is light. A, a few years ago, Leslie and I had a letter which was dropped through our front door and when we opened it, of course it was incredibly exciting when we saw what it was. What we held in our hands was an elegantly designed and a thrilling for us invitation to go to Buckingham Palace for a garden party uh, with the Queen and uh, we had the most wonderful day those few years ago. And in these verses that we have just read, there is the most wonderful invitation. And there is no more wonderful invitation than to hear the words Jesus speaks when he says there in verse 28, Come to me. There's no greater invitation that you or I could ever hear, ever receive in our lives than to hear this invitation of Jesus to come to him. And this invitation to come is that we may live ultimately the whole of our lives transformed by him and with him. And not just for the summer of 2021, come to me, but for the whole of life. But what grace. I want to share this word at the start of this summer period. What grace may we experience 
Uh, in what ways may our life with God grow even this summer as we choose in these moments to hear the invitation of Jesus? Would you come to me this summer? Would you come and encounter me? Would you come and be with me? Come to me. Uh, what grace, what new depth of just the wonder of who he is may impact and shape our lives as we hear that invitation at the start of this summer. So this morning I could, of course, focus for our message thinking about us, the, the ones to whom this invitation is given. Uh, we could think of the encouragement of, of all that it means for, for those this, this very day who are perhaps feeling weary after the difficult season we, we, we are in and have been in for a long time, those who are heavy uh, laden, using that language, this heavy burden, things that we've carried, uh, whether they're circumstances or in fact even the very sins and the, the regrets that could otherwise shape our lives. We could think about who this invitation was given to and, and, and to, to think about it from that perspective that we may know his rest. But instead this morning, and for this message and, and let me say by the way the text does allow us to look at that but I want us to think at the start of the summer I want you to consider with me just not who the invitation for but just who it is that is speaking to us today saying come to me you see from considering him even just for a few moments this morning uh, I trust that our hearts will be encouraged to, to take these verses uh, and to take something even, perhaps even of Matthew's gospel. What a, an invitation to go through the gospel of Matthew this summer and to see who is this Jesus who is speaking to us, saying, come to me. So as we hear that invitation, I want us to slow down enough this morning to ask this question, who is it that's speaking them to us? Now, in one sense, of course, the answer is Jesus. Uh, in fact, from our Sunday school days, we always know that the answer is, is Jesus. Um, but we can answer that question quickly. Or we can just slow down and take a look at this context. Um, it's, you know, we know it's Jesus. That's obvious, isn't it? But in the context of Matthew 11, John the Baptist, at least, enclosed as he was, hemmed in, life away from the sunshine, a life away from, from the joy of that, enclosed in a prison, he begins to ask this question. He's no longer sure. He knew, he thought he was, but now he's saying this question, Jesus, are you the one who is to come? Or should we be looking for someone else? And I guess this morning I want to ask this question, have you ever doubted? Have you ever doubted what the Bible says about God? I wonder if you've ever had those kind of questions and doubted this good news that, that, that right across light and life in the free Methodist Church we continue to proclaim. There's good news, there's hope, there's forgiveness, and it's found in Jesus. I wonder if you've ever had moments, times of doubt, where uh, in, in, the, in the reality of this message being proclaimed, when we've sat at home alone and we've wondered to ourselves, is it real? Really? And this morning I've spoken the words of this most wonderful invitation of Jesus to come to me. And perhaps where you are right now, perhaps in the circumstances that you find yourself in, perhaps in the things that are happening in your life or your family, uh, into this world that we're all living in, a world disorientated by COVID and, and a world that's been affected by tensions globally and, and disasters, let alone what may be happening in our own lives and in our circumstances, uh, lives that have been turned upside down in one way or another. This morning, uh, you can come just as you are with the questions, with the uncertainties, and, and you too can hear this invitation of Jesus, come to me. And I'm wanting to think about that this morning. If you've ever wrestled with doubts like, uh, like this, Alistair McGrath, uh, in his book that he wrote called When Doubt Becomes Unbelief, he encourages us in that book by reminding us we are not alone if we've ever had times where we need that sense of, where we've got questions or we need that reassurance. He said this, doubt is natural within faith. It, it comes because of our human weakness and frailty. He goes on to say, unbelief is the decision to live your life as if there is no God. 
It's a deliberate decision to reject Jesus and all that he stands for. But he says doubt is something quite different. Doubt arises within the context of faith. It's a wistful longing to be sure of things in which we trust. Let me say that again. Doubt, those kind of questions that John says, Jesus, are you real? Are you the one? Doubt arises within the context of faith. It's a wishful, wishful longing to be sure of things in which we trust. We want to be sure. There's more that could be said about this today, but let me say it's not unusual for questions like that of John to come from this longing to be reassured when life is tough and life is difficult. When John, through his disciples, asked Jesus this question, Jesus, are you the one? We can learn from this about the times that we too may feel that we also need some kind of assurance. John, he was facing a difficult situation. You know, he, he knew what it was to have been out and about proclaiming God's word with great boldness. He'd been preparing people for the coming king who was coming into the world. He'd been pointing people to Jesus. Look, behold, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But now, as a result of his boldness, he's been arrested. He's been put in prison. He, he perhaps has experienced hunger and, and physical torment, uh, perhaps emotional struggle. He's probably felt uh, alone there. And in the circumstances that John was in, he is now just looking for that reassurance. Jesus, are you the one? You see, difficult circumstances for you and me can lead us to those moments of questions, those moments where we need reassurance. Not only was he facing a difficult situation, but actually uh, we have to say he was experiencing a, a profound unmet expectation that he had been carrying. John had been proclaiming to the people the promised king and that this king would come and he would sort everything out. This, this threshing instrument was going to be his hand. He'd sort out the good from the bad, the evil uh, from the good. And, and, but the, and he would come and do that. He would sweep through like a fire in the nation, making everything right. But here's the thing. Roman rule was still in place. Political and religious corruption was still at large. It's why he was in prison. Everything in this regard for John just seemed as if it's been unchanged. It's the way it's been for generations. And Jesus, instead of dealing with all of this, what does Jesus do? He spends time with irreligious people, people not from a churchy background, broken, sinful people. He, he tells them about forgiveness of sins. He, he's praying for and is encouraging people to pray for and love their enemies. He's not overthrowing them. He's doing something incredibly different. And perhaps in those moments, John through all that he had proclaimed, all that he thought he knew and understood as he read the scriptures, is struggling with unmet expectations. And he's thinking, isn't the Messiah supposed to be a righteous king? Wasn't he supposed to end all this brokenness and this evil in the world? Jesus, are you the one? We can understand this. Because we too can, can think following and trusting Jesus surely would see some kind of change in the narrative. Different things worked out in our lives. Jesus, I honestly thought following you would end some of these things that I am still facing. Jesus, are you real? John, thirdly, and connected to this second one of unmet expectations, John was seeing things from a limited perspective. It's not that this what he had seen was 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 wrong, but it was limited. John simply could not grasp all that was happening in this moment or all that was unfolding around him. In reality, many times for us, questions of doubt emerge from the same kind of ground. You see, when difficult things happen and we can't see the purpose for them and, and we're not really seeing what God is working out or what God is doing in them. And we kind of thought, God, there's a far better way of making your name known and, and doing things to make a difference in our world. God, where are you and why is this happening? We begin to see this is the same ground as it was for John. John had understood from certain verses of the Old Testament, from the Bible, uh, before Jesus, what the Messiah was to be and do. 
But John had seen things from a limited perspective. He hadn't grasped everything. God in the person of Jesus was bringing in his kingdom into the world. And it, and it is good news. But it was not what was expected by many in their day. And to be fair, including John, God's kingdom was going to be more than just a political change in one nation where injustice and evil were to be dealt with. All that he took, that, that there would just be this light in the world through, through this change in the nation of Israel. God was bringing in his kingdom, not just to change the political climate of one country, but where sin and even death would be dealt with. And, and it was a kingdom of good news for all people. And John hadn't fully grasped this. Now we can peel that back a little bit. But the reality is, is that we from time to time can find ourselves in circumstances and moments that are particularly hard. And the burdens feel heavy. And we can struggle with difficult circumstances and unmet expectations and we can have a limited perspective we think we we know what god should be doing but but he is doing more than we can imagine and we're just struggling to see it uh, let alone the context of the burdens and the weights that we can carry from the broken sin-filled choices that we can make with our lives that just wear us down and somehow wish we could turn back the clock and as matthew writes his gospel he writes these words as he, he selects everything that he puts in his gospel. He writes these things because he wants people to come to know that Jesus really is king. He is the promised king. He is the forever king. He writes because he wants to provide uh, those of us who have come to faith with an equipping and encouraging and strengthening revelation of who Jesus is. For those who have come to faith, but in his day, whose lives were being tested and they may too, like John have been tempted to ask what's going on here is this real so right here in Matthew chapter 11 he reminds us in this this good news gospel of saying Jesus is who he is and and, and for those of you who are being tested take heart he reminds us in the context of faith being tested and questions and doubts being surfaced and burdens being felt due to life circumstances he brings us to these words of Jesus where he says, come to me. So having said all of this, uh, let's go back to what we said at the start. Who is it that is speaking these words to us? Come to me. So having given that picture and that context, I want us to see, first of all, how Jesus responds to John in the message he sends through John's disciples back to John when he asked Jesus are you the one and he tells them to tell John tell him what you've seen and heard and he goes on to highlight two things for John's terms that I think are an incredible help to us by referring to verses in Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 Jesus is telling John and us trust him trust him for he really is the one promised in God's word by reminding John of the words of Isaiah about the coming of the Messiah and what he would do, the blind are seeing John, the lame are walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor are hearing the good news. In, in one says one of the things that Jesus is doing is saying, John, look at what was written about me, not just some of those verses you've landed on, but look at all that the scripture has promised that the, the coming king would be. John. See that I am the king, really the one who was promised. Take heart, John. You know, it's not the best illustration for so many reasons. But perhaps we've heard or read of moments when on the stage of theatre, when in order to freshen the performance that has been done so many times, you know, at performance after performance, day after day, things are beginning to get stale. A lead actor suddenly changes the script. I mean, they don't compromise the integrity of the story, but they do something different. And in that moment, the stage comes alive. The other actors weren't expecting it, but suddenly things are different. They're alive to the moment and they're engaged. Well, as I said, it's not the best illustration, but in a far more profound sense, John and these other people in his day, they thought they knew all the script. 
It had become familiar to them. It had shaped what they expected. But in this moment, Jesus reminds John. Matthew in his gospel reminds all who are reading the gospel. Jesus really is the king who was promised in the Old Testament. Time and again, Matthew through the gospel says this happened as Jesus fulfilled what was written in the prophet. Time and again, you read Matthew's gospel, you see that he is the king that the Old Testament was promising. He really is the king who is coming. And Jesus, when he says to John, John, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame are walking, the poor are hearing the good news. John would have known Jesus was drawing his attention to God's word of the promised king of who the Messiah would be. Look, John, I am the king promised in the Bible. He is the righteous king. Absolutely, John. And all empires and kingdoms will one day submit to him. One day every knee will bow to him. He is the, the, the promised king who would impact lives in these powerful and wonderful ways to show that the kingdom of God has really broken in to this present age, filling us with hope, even as we look for the hope of its complete fullness in the age to come. But when Jesus says, come to me, what an invitation for us to engage this summer or to re-engage with the Bible, to ask the Holy Spirit with all that is going on in our lives to see who Jesus really is. He is the one promised in the scripture. He really is. We can see the wonder of who he is. We can, we can be reminded of the promises that are found in him. We can find our hearts strengthened in hope and faith. This is Jesus. He's the good shepherd. He's the one who lays down his life for the sheep. He's the one who says, I'll never leave you. We, we land on this wonderful truth of who Jesus, he really is, the promised king. And my heart, uh, my prayer is that our hearts would be really encouraged with hope as we see the one who's promised. They'd be refreshed by grace and that they'd be strengthened again for life and for mission. Jesus wants John to know in his search for assurance, John I am the one written about in God's word. I'm the one who was promised, John. You can find me. You can meet me. You can see who I am. And scripture reveals to us the wonder and the beauty and the magnificence of Jesus. John, believe what is said about me in the whole of scripture. But also, John, secondly, I want you to trust me the things that I have done and am doing. Trust him for the things that he's done and the things that he's doing. You know, uh, go and tell him what you've seen and heard. So it's not just that it was a fulfillment of a promise, Jesus was actually doing it. Our faith can be strengthened when we hear of the stories of the things that Jesus has and is doing. I know we can be tempted at times to feel, well, why them and not me? Why has the story been transformed for them, but I'm still struggling? And Jesus is not insensitive when he tells John about his life, powerful, loving deeds that, that, that are transforming lives. He's encouraging and strengthening the faith of John by helping him see that right now in this present age, he really is the king who is at work and lives are being changed. You see, like John, we can face times of testing and times of encouragement. We can, we can face times when we ask, are you the one? Where are you? And times when we are thrilled because of his inbreaking power at work in our lives. And by reminding John in this low moment, in this difficult experience, in this difficult circumstance, whilst we live in this present age, that has both good stories and bad stories, that has wonderful things that God is doing and brokenness. While we live in this world, uh, we know that these things can impact our lives too. We can know the, the, the mountain highs and the valley lows. We can know rejoicing and suffering. We can know sorrow uh, and, and, uh, and celebration. And Jesus, as he writes to him, is reminding him, reassuring him, John, I am the promised king, but John, I am powerfully at work. And I want you to tell him what's been happening. See, this is meant to encourage and strengthen faith. You know, I saw a video this week from someone who I believe uh, is connected to Harvester Ministries. Uh, we have a connection in Helston 
uh, with that ministry and in some way following the really difficult days this week in South Africa where there's been lots of looting and violence. It's been really quite desperate. This lady, and, uh, and I don't know where it came from, she somehow got hold of this piano and she set it up in the middle of a street that had been absolutely just messed up and turned upside down. There was devastation everywhere and in the middle of that she starts playing this piano. It was a mess and yet she is worshipping God. Here I am to worship right here in the mess of this world. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. And you know what? As I watched that video in the middle of that brokenness, my heart was strengthened. My faith was encouraged. God is at work. He's demonstrating his kingdom. Lives are being transformed. His love is seen. And it's not that difficult and broken things don't happen, but right in the middle of them, we see his kingdom come. That's what's going on. As John is sat enclosed in the darkness of a prison, Jesus is saying, tell him, I'm the promised king. I'm powerfully at work in the world. You know, I found Michael Green in his commentary on this chapter in John really helpful. When thinking about these powerful works of Jesus in the context of this passage, it, uh, Michael Green in that commentary reminds us that the signs themselves can strengthen belief, but they can't compel belief. They can strengthen our faith, but they can't make someone believe. For some, you see, they can look uh, and find other explanations of what is happening and the difference that is being made other than God. And if we don't want to see and if we don't want to believe, no miracle can convince us. People in Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum had seen God's powerful works, but they didn't believe. In fact, despite all the powerful things that Jesus had done, in chapter 12, the Pharisees again come to him saying, Jesus, we want you to give us a sign of who you are. He tells them, none will be given you except that of Jonah, who spent three days in the belly of a great fish. And then uh, he, Michael Green reminds he was then brought back from what could only be described as a watery grave. You know, in all of this, Jesus who said, come to me, is the one who is promised. We can see him, the promised king in the scriptures, but he is the one through whom the works of God have been displayed. Not only in the miracles that happened in his life and ministry, not only in some of the wonderful things that he's still doing in our world today, but Jesus in, in this, this message to John was pointing forward that we look back on that Jesus really is the one the king who was promised, who came into the world and died on the cross and rose again from the dead. We are here. We're celebrating. We lift our hearts to God. We find hope because scripture declares and we ourselves uh, are reminded and are strengthened by this. Jesus died and he rose again. Our whole faith and our whole hope rest on this. And Jesus, in this way, forward pointing, reminds them of this. He shows the power of God in the one who gave himself, breaking the power of death, rising again. So who is it this morning that says to us, whatever is going on in your life, who is it that says, come to me? He's the king for sure. He's the promised king. He's the powerful king. And he invites us to come to him. And my prayer this summer, is that we may draw nearer and nearer to him, that we may encounter his grace, bringing hope through God's word. We may be encouraged in faith as we see not only what he does 2,000 years ago in the scripture, but we may engage, we may see and hear stories across our town, across our nation, across the Free Methodist Church, in, in missions news from around the world. We may actually find our faith strengthened if we are in difficult circumstances by the one who's alive and that work powerfully in the world. So this morning, whether the issue is doubt or whether the issue is being weighed down by sin and regrets, Jesus invites us, come to me. And I want to finish with one last picture in the verses that we have read. I hope it'll serve as one last encouragement to a summer of growing closer to him. Who is this Jesus who speaks to us? I just want to give you this picture. Promise King, powerful king but if you've got any doubt or any uncertainty whether in going to him you can do so with confidence he wants to say to those of you who are feeling worn out 
by regrets and sins or doubts from the difficult circumstances. He says, come to me because you will find me humble and lowly and gentle in heart. You know, I don't know about you, but what a wonderfully rich encouragement. We can come to the promised powerful king who is humble and lowly and gentle in heart. So with all our questions, with all our weighed down baggage, what an invitation this summer. Come to him. Isn't he wonderful? And you'll find rest for your souls. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are with us and thank you that you're king. And, and I pray, Lord, for all that's an hostile light in life, for those who are uh, in all kinds of perhaps perhaps challenges or difficult circumstances, weighed down by life, perhaps affected by regrets. Lord, I pray that at the start of this summer they would hear your invitation. Come to me. And I pray that they would know your love, your gentleness, your grace, but that they would know you, that, that you're the promised and powerful king and you're able to meet them. And, and I pray that there would be that experience of peace and rest for the soul as forgiveness is found and grace is found in the middle of circumstances. Lord, I pray they'd hear your invitation this morning. Come, draw near to me, find grace in me, find rest for your soul. Jesus, thank you. May you meet with them now. May your grace come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys.